Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Bloodborne. We are about to enter a really cool new optional area. Uh, before we even get that far though, I want to turn your attention to something pretty neat. It's something you might not have ever noticed before, but if you're playing online, the number of messengers crowded around the lantern seem to be a relative indication of how many other people are in the same area as you online. Uh, so there appears to be a note nailed to this door. This town is long abandoned. Hunters not wanted here. It's a warning. Which we are going to ignore. Got a human voice off in the distance warning us to turn back, along with that note nailed to the door. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that again. What we will do is take a detour to chase after this little dude, uh, who is a scurrying skull beast. They appear to function the same way crystal lizards did in the previous games. They spot you, they run away, uh, they try to tunnel underground, and if you let them, they will just disappear until you reload the area. Once they're killed, they'll drop some upgrade materials, and then they will disappear for good. They don't respawn. Uh, and pay attention how vertical the layout of this uh, this zone is, this district. And here, these are some new enemy... Whoa, 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 whoa. These are some new enemy types. You can see they build up uh, slow poison on you. And once that bar fills all the way, if they hit you enough, uh, you will become poisoned. It takes slow damage over time until you cure it with an antidote. Uh, let's check out that Hunter's Torch. You can see it actually does a little bit more fire damage than the regular one. A torch formed by wrapping a pine resin drenched cloth around the, e at the end of a long stick. Once used in Old Yarnum, designed to incinerate beasts and victims touched by the Scourge. Its fire damage is highly effective against beasts. Uh, it's a better torch, basically. Monsters are afraid of flame. Uh, there's a few other fire-related item descriptions which mention that. I think the fire paper and the Molotov. Explodes in raging flames when thrown against an object, one of the oldest hunter tools available in the workshop. Since the tragedy that struck Old Yarnum fire has become a staple in beast hunts and is thought to cleanse impurity, certain types of beasts have an abnormal fear of flame. Uh, so, speaking of light sources, we also got the Skull Lantern last time. You could see it clips onto your belt. I did a small amount of grinding off screen so I could get the 2000 uh, blood echoes I need for it. It's kind of like the Augite of Guidance from Demon Souls. It provides less light than a torch, and speaking of grinding, I spent a few minutes farming the werewolf near the lantern so I could plus three this Kirk Hammer early. On the one side, an easily handled silver sword, on the other, a giant obtuse stone weapon characterized by a blunt strike and extreme force of impact. The church takes it takes a heavy-handed, merciless stance toward the Plague of Beasts, an irony not lost upon the wielders of this most symbolic weapon. This thing is amazing. Mike and I spent like literally five minutes gawking at this transformation animation. Uh, because if you look closely, your character turns it, turns the sword into the hammer to lock it in place. Uh, then it, then he turns it again to unlock the sword and pull it out. We found this out because Mike asked how did, how the sword stays locked in place when you insert it into the stone part of the hammer. They actually thought about that. That's insane. That's an insanely unnecessary awesome detail that makes a Miyazaki game. Those, like, the culmination of all those little details. It's this fucking giant stone hammer where a sword is sheathed in the stone and it acts as the handle. And then when you transform it, it becomes a straight sword. So the straight sword is the handle for the hammer. The Kirk hammer is so amazing. I love this weapon. About to mark out for this thing. It's so cool. It kicks ass. Uh, you have to be careful around here because you see these smoldering uh, bodies and ruins and rubble. The sm the, they, they will just hide enemies behind the smoke. It is an actual smoke screen. Uh, and these guys, that guy you can see shielding his eyes, that's what the item description was talking about. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Was talking about. They're afraid of flame. Uh, the little ones are anyway. So whether that be your torch or the burning crucified werewolves, they will cover their eyes and cower. Uh, it makes them less aggressive. 
Let's mess around with this Kirk Hammer some more. I love this weapon so much. You can power through some of their hits with it, too. It's got a little bit of hyper armor. You know, just grazed him. Come at me. Ah, oh, I wanted him to approach me instead of cowering. Yeah. Yeah, the bigger enemies uh, appear to not be afraid of the flame because they have a hood or a shawl draped over their faces. Fire, in particular, has a very special significance in this uh, part of town, which was alluded to in the Hunter's Torch description. There was some kind of tragedy. The town was clearly burned to the ground and cold. Uh, we'll learn some really cool stuff about this town. And we have that warning in uh, uh, the NPC telling us to, to go away, that the beasts in this town are of no threat to the town above. It was totally sectioned off and abandoned. Old Yarnum is awesome. It's where we're going to start learning a lot of really cool stuff. And back here, you constantly have to be on your feet. There are a lot of ambushes for the, uh, the, the smaller beasts and the, the bigger women. Fortunately, I don't know the enemy names. Big Bertha, Tiny Tims. Oh, I think I accidentally had to skip some of his dialogue because of the fighting. God damn, I love that charge swing so much. They just run into it and get wrecked. This is my favorite weapon. And you can see there's a sweet spot to it. More on that in just a second. I think uh, our friend up on the, the clock tower has some more dialogue in just a moment. Yeah, they don't like the fire either. This stage is about to get really cool. Oh no! Well, there's the surprise for the level. We have uh, our NPC friend up there who's named uh, Gula or Jura, something along those lines, depending on how it's translated up on this vantage point of the clock tower, raining bullets down from a, uh, this giant Gatling gun. Um, there's a spot over here where he can reach over the wall, so this makes fighting her really awkward. This is a kind of an awkward position to fight her from. Oh my god, I can't believe I'm not dead. Uh, I need to... Okay, I'm not getting... Yeah, there we go. There's this little spot at the bottom of the stairs where he can rain bullets down. Ugh. Ugly, ugly, ugly fight. And you, not, you might notice those ones are a lot bigger uh, than the other big Berthas we fought. Uh, the other ones were tiny Berthas. Okay, so we have some temporary shelter in here. This, this sequence is so cool. Uh, so I'm gonna come down here and evade him to fire because those are explosive, flammable urns. Come on, I want to bait the uh, tiny Tims in here and just handle them. I, I'm not sure if they will inflict poison on you. Yeah, there we go. Um, you also might not have heard it, but. The uh, NPC sniping at us with a Gatling gun is uh, the same voice actor as Marvelous Chester or uh, King Vendrick. Yeah, so we have this really unique sequence where you're running around trying to take cover and fighting your way past his clock tower vantage point, and there's nothing else like this in a Souls game. Um, it is incredibly hectic, too, your first time around. Even for me, it's still hectic. Okay. Oh, hey, she has friends. Uh... Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, that was the L2 attack for the Kirkhammer, by the way. So, uh, in hammer mode, you can't have the torch out because it's a two-handed weapon. Any weapon that you two-hand has an extra attack. L2 acts as an extra attack here. Uh, L2 would normally be your left-handed attack, like, uh, firing your pistol or your shotgun or whatever 
or using your torch. Here, it's an entirely different swing. For the Kirk Hammer, it's this really nice horizontal one. And that transformation animation is the best! That transformation attack! It's wildly impractical, but still, it's so goddamn cool. This is the best weapon. Oh my god, it's the best weapon. Okay, we have this place cleared out. I can I can chill a little bit, collect some stuff inside, and then uh, we're going to be making a mad dash here in a second. Uh, because there are a couple of ways you can go about dealing with uh, Gula up here. That's what I'm going to be calling him. Uh, his... The other way I've seen his name spelled and written is D-J-U-R-A, uh, Dura or Jura, something like that. Uh, I'm going to be going with Gula because that's the other way you can write it out. So now we can actually climb up to the clock tower that he's been shooting at us from. You can fight him straight up, you can choose to not fight him at all and come back later and he'll be friendly to you. Um, I am going to cheese the shit out of him. It's probably one of the cheesiest things you're going to see me do in the whole playthrough. So he's at the opposite end of the clock tower. Uh, he just gets done manning his Gatling gun. If you dash up to him and you fire or you start hitting R1 or R2, you can actually knock him off without having to fight him, because he is a pain to fight. He is really, really tough at this stage of the game. Um, and I think that's because you're really not meant to kill him at this point. I think they intend for you to come back later. Oh, this is a really neat new feature of the uh, messages. You can actually leave a gesture and a message now. Uh, and let's read this fine, because I want to show you something. Oh my god, that's so adorable! When you write a message as fine or foul, the messengers react! Like, when you write it fine, they start dancing! This game, man, this fucking game is amazing! Oh, you're waiting for me, all right, okay. I, I knew that was coming, I still got clipped. Uh, we're not done with that bottom floor, by the way. Uh, let's look at, I, I don't want to break this foul because it fucks that guy up, but. When you write a message foul instead of dancing, the messengers cry. Uh, there's also a, a, an ancillary effect of writing a message, uh, appraising it as a fine message. Any message that you rate as fine will uh, help to recover the writer's HP in their world. So if you plop down a message, and you see this a lot in uh, the other Souls, god damn it, the other Souls games, uh, someone will just write something like, help me. And that's because if you if you uh, upvote it, put it in Reddit terms, uh, if you upvote their message, they get a little bit of health back, which can be a lifesaver sometimes. Uh, so Gula died in a spot where I can't retrieve his corpse's items. Uh, that's not actually a problem, though. If we reload the area, you can go back to the top of the clock tower, and his items will be up there instead. Sometimes he falls to the floor, and they are more easily reachable. We also have this dickhead hunter, uh, using what appears to be, uh, saw spear? Or the, the saw cleaver? Along with a blunderbuss. Um, he's no fun to fight. But he's really easy to ignore. I think he might actually be one of uh, Gula's friends. Uh, they're part of a group of church hunters known as the Powder Kegs, which we'll learn more about from uh, the badge we get off of Gula's corpse. Walk into it. Yeah. It takes some timing to figure that out, but once you do, you can have that that R2 charge attack for the Kirkhammer wound up just in time. So it comes down on an approaching enemy, and it feels incredible. Right, I actually didn't go into too much detail about that. This NPC does this weird-ass backpedal animation, this cycle. I can't quite... Ah, oh, I want to get around you. Okay, we're good. I think we're good. Uh, so, I was... By the way, there is, uh... Oh my god, I'm so coated in blood. Crimson. Hopefully the NPC down there chills out now that he's maybe stuck on the ladder. Um, I want to try to get around him because there's more secrets aside from that ladder shortcut. Uh, which you're more free to utilize now that Gula is dead. 
Um, I was saying that Kirk Hammer is kind of tricky to use because, like in other Souls games, there's a sweet spot on it. If you're right in an enemy's face, you might hit them with the handle of the hammer, which does less damage. You can uh, just barely scrape them with the very edge, and it does barely anything. But if you hit them dead center with a stone part, with the heaviest part of the hammer, they will take massive amounts of damage. Uh, this is where I want to try to get around. Uh, I'm going to clear a few crows out and still be in chase down. That's fine. Ooh, don't get caught. Yeah, that looks like the saw spear. Saw spear and maybe the pistol. Uh, so we want to take a running leap off of here for a really, really hidden uh, spot. I don't know how many people actually think to to take the running jump off of that ledge, but it conceals uh, a weapon and an armor set. And a whole lot of enemies in here. Uh, also a chest. Okay, so we have a lot of big Berthas. And tiny Berthas. Kind of just want to call them old hags. I don't even know if they're women, to be honest. Ooh, God, we are not getting this one off on the right foot. And uh, we're about to have more problems. Where are you? There. Yeah. That All the commotion downstairs wakes, down, wakes up everything upstairs. Now we are surrounded. Uh, so I'm going to, to the best of my ability, use the amazing crowd control functions of the whip, uh, and maybe bottleneck them in this doorway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, it clanged off the wall. Not good. Okay. Nope. It's you two. Oh, can they not get outside? I didn't mean for this to happen. I didn't want to cheese them that hard. Uh, Gula, I'll cheese every time. Some of them are going back upstairs. They just kind of lost interest. That bounding box. Okay, they're leashing. I think I'm pretty okay on the bottom floor here. I can just go and deal with them later. Okay, that could have gone a lot worse. That could have gone pretty bad. Uh, we get six blood vials from that corpse. And in here, I think we get a gemstone. Am I right about that? Tempering blood gemstone. Um, I should probably explain all that stuff. Especially since I mentioned that I plus three the Kirk Hammer earlier. Yeah, let's explain upgrades real quick. Um, upgrading bl in Bloodborne is about as straightforward as it's ever been. Uh, wep weapons can be upgraded uh, up to plus ten. Each level that you upgrade something gives you a little bit more base damage, a little bit better stats, better scaling coefficient. Got the rifle spear back there. We'll see that in a sec. Um, each tier of upgrades requires a different material, so it takes 15 shards to go from baseline to plus 3, it takes 15 twin shards to go from plus 3 to plus 6, it takes 15 chunks to go from plus 6 to plus 9, and a blood rock to go from 9 to 10. Uh, in other words, every tier of upgrade materials goes like 3, 5, and 8. So 3 for the first, uh, 5 for the next, 8 for the last one in that tier. Red Moon hangs low, beasts rule the streets, or we left no other choice than to burn it all to cinders. Huh, I didn't know there was a lore note up here. And there we get the charred hunter set. Uh, again, very significant to the the theme of flame in Old Yarnum. Uh, so we'll check out the rifle spear real quick, a trick weapon crafted by the workshop heretics of powder kegs. A prototype weapon serving as a simple firearm and spear possibly created an imitation of a lost Kanehurst weapon. Lacks any notable function, saving that it's the only trick weapon with an attached gun. Pretty cool. Uh, and then we also have the charred Yarnum stuff that we picked up. Uh, hunter trousers. One of the staple articles of hunter attire fashion at the workshop, a product of the scourge of, be of the beast that once plagued old Yarnum and culminated in the town's fiery cleansing. Designed to be highly resistant to fire, wearers of this attire hunted down victims of the scourge. Yeah, you get the idea. Uh, and this dumps us back out into a really cool spot. Which you'll see when I turn around why we couldn't have come up here any other way. Uh, we couldn't have gotten up here any other way because... Oh, hey, an item. Uh, there's a little ledge there. So we could have only gotten to that area from the drop we made. And it brings us, like, directly back to where we made that drop, basically. There's the hunter. This will wind up being a shortcut later. Again, pay attention to the verticality of this level. It's pretty insane um, how layer, how many layers deep this one goes. Uh, 
Uh, the other aspect of customizing your weapons in Bloodborne that I failed to mention just now is uh, you get this really crazy extra level of customizations from uh, the Blood Gems, one of which we picked up in a chest back there. They kind of act like socketable gems. Uh, you unlock more sockets in a weapon as you upgrade it. I think it's up to three and there are different socket types. Uh, these blood gems can give you a lot of flexibility. Uh, they can add stuff like damage, HP regeneration, elemental stuff, uh, scaling, and a lot more. Kind of like, it, it, it kind of functions like a replacement for the infusions from Dark Souls 1. Oh, I can go back, okay. We have a lot of drop downs and stuff we have to make here. Into this haunting, eerie church. Oh, okay. Yeah, scared the hell out of me. Ah, uh, now I have to make a jump. Goddamn, that's the first time I've ever missed that jump. Okay, we can come back for that later. Ah, uh, now we have to drop to the bottom floor. Fall damage again, not gonna be a huge problem. And now I'm just gonna book it. I am gonna run away from all the scary screaming up here. Uh, to where I can control the fight that's coming for me. Yeah, good look at what's behind me. There's stuff coming through the doorway. Uh, everything seems to have red glowing eyes now. If you notice, that's new. Uh, their eyes weren't glowing like that before. That's a product of all the screeching. It incenses all of the enemies around. Um, and they also gain a, a poison buff. Uh, to where if they if these regular enemies hit you now, they will start stacking poison on you. Uh, and they're being kind of nice to me. They're not all coming through the door at once. Uh, either way, with a whip, again, you get a good opportunity to control this crowd. Uh, they're starting to filter in more, though. So I gotta kind of stay on top of this. Okay. You can die next. So, I think I'm done with the tiny ones. Finally get a good look under their cowls. Oh. Yeah, we have even more filtering in. Uh, and... Wow. God damn. There's a lot of enemies here. So, yeah, we'll keep the whip out. Just try to control this. That wild thrashing attack... That is dangerous to get caught in. It poisons you so quick. And it does so much damage. This is a clusterfuck of a fight. Oh wow, look at the blood in the environment. I think this is the last one. Good. No, there's still more coming from downstairs. Holy shit. Oh my god. Okay, is that the last two? Should be able to finish you off. Oh my god. Wow! I got too greedy and I got too overeager to finish that. I think that was probably the last two or three. Whew. That's, that's an intense fight. That is uh, not to be taken lightly. Well, this gives us a chance to show off a quick run back. Um, also gives me a chance to run it back. And, uh grab that item that I missed from the jump. It's, uh, it's, it's a skin for the messengers, the thing that I missed up there. Uh, so with the, uh, the first, it's not even really a shortcut opened up. It's just now that Eula's dead, um, we can take the ladder down instead and skip a whole lot of, uh, of the circuitous pathway here. Uh, you could also just go straight forward towards the uh, burning werewolf and make a straight drop down. Saves you probably a few seconds. Uh, but now we can take the ladder. Only have to worry about, hey, falling uh, Tiny Tims. And the hunter concealed in the smoke, who's not really a big threat. Uh, she's a pain to fight mostly because she will, like an enemy player, heal at half health. Uh, if you don't have an item called Numbing Mist which I don't have any of, so I'm not going to be fighting it just yet. Her, him. Uh, this also gives me a chance to show this off. When you uh, die or reload the area by going back to the Hunter's Dream and coming back here, either way, you'll be able to see that Gula's items will be up here now. 
instead of on the floor where he fell to his death. Uh, and from him, you get the powder keg badge. Badge crafted by the powder kegs, the heretics of the workshop. The powder kegs' adoration of complex design and big booms culminated in weapon designs that contrast with those traditionally of the workshop. The late powder kegs, bless their souls, had a motto. If a weapon ain't got kick, it just ain't worth it. With the powder keg badge, we'll not only be able to pick up Gula's gear, which I think is called the Ashen Hunter set, uh, we'll also be able to pick up the weapon, which he uses and we didn't get to see a whole lot of. It's called the Stake Driver, and it's pretty fucking amazing in its own right. The weapons in Bloodborne are so distinct and unique, and they have their own identities, uh, which is pretty awesome. There are way, way, way less of them than uh, weapons in any of the Souls games, but they have such... They have so much more personality to them, so much more individual individuality, that it's kind of worth it. Uh, now we'll make this jump correctly, yes. Uh, and come over here and pick up the bloody messenger hat for our messengers. Uh, we haven't gotten the one that I really, really want yet. Uh, now the downside is we get to do this clusterfuck of a fight all over again. Um, and... Don't mistake me calling it a clusterfuck for disapproval. I really, really like this encounter. The entirety of Old Yarnum is really hectic. Um, from Gula and his minigun to this section right here and some stuff coming up uh, as we progress even further down into Old Yarnum. Yeah! Feel like a boss when you dodge like that. Okay. So if I can control this doorway a little bit better as a choke point, I think I'll be in better shape. Uh, I'm limited by my stamina, though, and how gracious the AI wants to be. Ah, damn it. I can get that back. I can get a little bit of it back. Okay. The only mistake I made last time, really, was that I got a little bit too greedy at the end, so... Let's just control this a little bit better. The whip is so incredible. I've heard a lot of people say now that the threaded cane isn't that good. Holy shit, they could not be more wrong. Um, it's got a, a really versatile moveset. It's, it doesn't have the highest damage of any weapon. Um, and you have to watch tight spaces and uh, how close you are to enemies because the startup of the whip part of the cane is pretty slow. Uh, that said, you can control space really effectively with this thing. Uh... Yeah. Uh, and the straight sword part of it is also really good. It has a great moveset to it. Um, yeah, you can cover space vertically, horizontally. Uh, you can cover your diagonals really well. The only thing it lacks is like a 360 kind of move. Um, and not many weapons have that aside from the Hunter Axe, which is what makes that Hunter Axe really good. Is it has a full 360 degree coverage move. And it does a little bit more damage. Every weapon kind of has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, like the saw cleaver, which I'll be switching to later on for the boss, uh, lacks range, but it's really good with uh, speed and damage. And we get some madman's knowledge back there. This is finally all cleared out. That's good. Uh, we're still not done. We're still not ready to enter the bottom floor of the church proper, though. I think it's a church anyway. Some kind of chapel where they're performing ritual sacrifices. I know there's one behind me. I'm gonna gamble and say I can kill this one before the other catches up to me. And I'm right. And Trent, that's the other transformation animation. Holy shit. Ah, oh, just barely. Back up. This is too goddamn fun. This game I'm so head over heels in love with. It's, you need to understand how big of a fan I am of the Souls games for me to say this. Bloodborne, not only up to this point, but the point I'm at deep, deep in the game with my other character, makes Dark Souls 1 look bad. That is, again, you have to understand what a fan I am of this series for that to be digestible as a sentence this game makes dark souls look bad <laughs> oh 
god. Uh, this is awesome. Cobb and gruesome. It's kind of this bloodletted uh, monster and ritual blood right at the altar next to it. Uh, so we have this monster strung up over a pool of blood and ritual blood. Material used in a holy chalice ritual. One of the basic ingredients used to satiate a holy chalice is this incoagulable. When all is melted in blood, all is reborn. Let's try that word again. Incoagulable. Oh my god, I can't, my mouth doesn't want to move in that way. Incoagulable. Blah, blah. Why can I not say this word? I could say coagulate. Incoagulable. There we go. I'm um, having word troubles. Not speaking goods. Oh my god, I'm also getting back to death by crows. I feel like I'm Prometheus. It was, uh, it was a raven that pecked at Prometheus's liver, right? Something like that. Some carrion bird. Uh, and they're guarding some bloodstone shards. Over there, if you look uh, at the pathway, that's leading towards the boss. That's the boss room right there. Another underappreciated detail about the Souls games and Bloodborne and Miyazaki stuff in general is whenever you see something in the distance, you immediately go, yeah, I'm going to go there eventually. Uh, in this case, it's pretty short term. But, like, think back even to the beginning of the game when I was doing the, the panoramic shot all around Central Yarnum. We went to all of those locations. Or at least we, are, we visited most of them and we're going to be on our way to them later. Uh, another brilliant aspect of this game. Goddamn shortcuts. Shortcuts everywhere. Uh, and this is part of why I'm telling you to pay attention to how, in particular, uh, vertical this district is of Old Yarnum, because that's not even the goddamn half of it. That's like, that's almost the halfway mark, um, of the level vertically of the floor that we climb that ladder to get to. Oh my god, I'm overloaded on this. It's so good. Um, whoa, I know we got you guys here. I'm trying not to go f too far forward because I think there's another one of those scurrying skull beasts. So I don't want to scare it away before I get a chance to engage it. I think I might have already done it. I think it spawns near the stairs in the corner. I don't hear it though. You, like the crystal, oh hey, wow, I'm just blind as shit. There you are. We'll find bigger versions of them later. Uh, I think the bigger ones fight back. Something tore the door down here. We enter the plaza and uh, we see a werewolf. Now, like I said before, I'm not intimidated by these very scary ass looking werewolves anymore uh, because I discovered how easy it is to stunlock them. And it's a good thing that I'm not intimidated by them anymore because we have more of them. Bam. Oh, oh, almost that stamina though. And follow up. It's so amazing to me the way the blood coats the environment, depending on your weapon. Because it, like, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe this. You just have to see it. You just have to be paying attention to the way the blood spatters. I feel like I'm Dexter right now, analyzing these spatter patterns. Um, but depending on your weapon, it spatters in different ways. Like, if you strike them with a hammer, it just spurts out like you're busting open a watermelon um if you're slashing at them with a sword it's just it goes everywhere it's a real mess if you slice them open with the the serrated whip though it creates this really nice thin line of blood that squirts from them and it's such a morbid detail but it's again it's just one of those little details that like how can you not appreciate the craftsmanship of this bloody ass game. So cool. Beast blood pellet. I knew that werewolf was there. He has scared me in the past. I knew you were waiting for me. Still got a good pot shot in. Okay, now that we've dealt with that particular threat, I feel safe in opening my inventory and examining this cool ass little thing we can ju uh, just got. We got beast bl blood pellet. Large medicinal pellets, supposedly formed of coagulated beast blood, banned by the healing church due to their unclear origins, grants a spur to beasthood. 
Ripping apart the flesh of one's enemies and being rained upon by their splattering blood invigorates one's sense of beasthood, feeding strength and euphoric feeling alike. Uh, I wanted to quiet down there so uh, you could hopefully get jump scared by this werewolf that pops through the door uh, and opens up the way to another shortcut. What that beast blood pellet did, uh, or does, it's a consumable, and it deals with your beasthood stat. Um, it, when you consume it, you get a temporary little buff, and as you attack, you'll fill up a meter. Uh, as you fill that meter up, the damage that you deal will increase, uh, but you'll also take more damage until you fill it all the way, and you get like a 50% damage buff or something. We're still not entirely sure whether or not there's a complete beast transformation in the game, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, what we do know is that if you fill that meter all the way with the beast blood pellet, you don't transform into a fucking werewolf, unfortunately. Uh, there's might still be hope. I don't know. There is a weapon in the game called the beast claws, which have a similar uh, effect as the beast blood pellet. And hey, look at where we are. Look at where that shortcut brings us up to the top level of, of old Yarnum. This insanely vertical level, we still have shortcuts. We've shortcuts for days. And this makes the run to the boss very, very quick. If you're dying a lot to a boss, and you are finding yourself frustrated because it's taking too long to run back to the boss, explore the area more because there will be a shortcut. I don't think that there is a, a, a boss run that's longer than maybe 30, 40 seconds might be a slight embellishment. Uh, yeah, exploration is king here. Anyway, I'm gonna head back to town, uh, to the Hunter's Dream, and I'm gonna cash in my Blood Echoes. So, we will return to Old Yarnum in just a second as I cash in. Actually, you know what? Instead of, of cutting this out... Uh, while I'm upgrading some stuff, I'm going to upgrade the saw cleaver to plus three and then finish topping off the threaded cane at plus three. And then I don't have anything left over. Okay, while I'm here, uh, why don't why don't I go through some uh, long-winded lore stuff? Uh, first of all, with Eula, if you come in from a different spot, uh, something you access later on, he will be friendly to you. And as long as you agree not to hurt the beast that he's kind of in old yarn and protecting, he will give you his badge as long as well as a gesture for free. Um, or you can kill him for that stuff like I did. And he has some dialogue if you approach him later when he's friendly. Uh, like he says that he no longer dreams, but he used to be a hunter. And that the hunt is barbaric because the beasts used to be normal people. And old Yarnum has been sectioned off from the rest of town, so they're not doing anybody any harm. Um, and old Yarnum is kind of fascinating in that way because it's where we can start to piece a lot of stuff together uh, as far as the story of this goes. Uh, but it's all very, very subtle. The Souls lore has always been like that, too. It's always been like an archaeological dig, is what I compared it to, uh, I think, last episode or the one before, where you really have a lot of dots that you have to connect, and you have a lot of things you have to piece together from pretty vague inferences. It relies a lot on observation and inference and interpretation, and this is kind of like a shared communal thing that everyone kind of tries to piece the story together as a community, which is really cool. Uh, Bloodborne is especially like that because it's a rabbit hole that leads to two more rabbit holes, which in turn each lead to like a dozen more rabbit holes. It's incredible. But piece by piece, you just try to put it all together and discuss and theorize, and that's such a fun way of doing storytelling in a game like this, and it's organic too. It's also why I'm always super eager to put these up because, like, I love hearing comments about lore theories. And uh, one more little disclaimer that I usually make, I by no means claim to have all the answers. Most of what I say in the, the Demon Souls LP or Dark Souls or Dark Souls 2 or here in Bloodborne or whatever, very little of that is concrete fact. Very little is set in stone. It's mostly just conclusions that I've drawn from my own analysis of the game and stuff I've synthesized from other sources and other people's interpretations. Uh, 
to get back on topic as we do this uh, little quick run back, though. I'm going to start from the Healing Church. Uh, and what I'm inferring from a lot of this stuff. The Healing Church stumbled upon blood healing. They started using a special blood to heal everyone. The blood gets tainted. We don't really know how yet. Uh, you can speculate it's maybe related to the chalices German mentioned, but all that matters right now is the blood the church used to heal people became tainted, and because they kept using it, a disease uh, called the Ashen Blood spread. It overtook Old Yarnum, and this is possibly the genesis of the Plague of Beasts that we've been dealing with. It's very possible, for reasons which might be explained later, the church uh, maybe exposed Yarnum to this tainted blood intentionally. Uh, and they organized the hunts and the hunters for a related reason. Uh, something to think about. The Ashen Blood and this Pale Blood that we've been tasked with seeking might also be related. Uh, either They might either be the same, or the Ashen Blood could relate to the Beast, while the Pale Blood might refer to something or someone with greater insight, let's say, as a tease. Uh, so anyway, the Ashen Blood disease runs rampant in Old Yarnum. The church can't remedy it with blood healing, and the description for antidotes, uh, your anti-poison item, states that uh, the antidotes only staved off the Ashen Blood temporarily. So Old Yarnum had to be burned and culled, and this might actually be the origin of the hunt. I don't know if hunters predate the culling of Old Yarnum, but it seems like uh, this is the origin of the hunt and the Plague of Beasts down here. Uh, it also explains the beasts running around here being poisonous, because it's it's ground zero for the Ash and Blood, uh, the poisonous source of the Beast Plague. Uh, it also explains why they're so afraid of fire. Uh, it's home to the Holy Chalice, one of the Holy Chalices that German talked about, uh, so that gives us room to speculate about how the blood became tainted in the first place. It's very possible it had something to do with some kind of chalice ritual they were performing uh, with a chalice down here, like bloodletting and sacrificing things. Also, up here, now that I think I've cleared this out... Oh, nope. One more. Yeah, you see the saw cleaver is really, really good. Okay, cool, cool. So, get a good look at this. Uh, this glowing circle on the ground. When you find these near boss rooms, you can summon an NPC to help you out. If you require assistance, you need only ring the bell. Uh, that's what it's for. Uh, that's my beckoning bell. Or I mean my, uh, my small resonant bell. The beckoning bell, you ring that one, and it will summon an NPC to help you out. That's what that's for. If you don't want to co-op online, you can still summon NPCs near those circles. Uh, you, I think you can summon Alfred to help you with the boss coming up here. For Cleric Beast, I think you can summon Father Gascoin. For Father G himself, I think you can summon Eileen, maybe? Not sure. Also, I'm wearing the uh, Gascoin set because it has high poison resistance, which is helpful for this boss. This appears to be, like, a larger version of those hooded enemies we've been fighting. Uh, with the shawls draped over their faces. L lanky and... emaciated. Uh, and flayed. You notice it has no skin left. It's been flayed alive. Uh, this is an optional boss. In fact, the whole place has been optional. Which just makes it that much cooler. Uh, so the Bloodstar Beast may have been flayed and, for lack of a better term, juiced as, like, to get its blood for the, the chalice ritual. Uh, every hit that this beast inflicts on you, ooh, like that, uh, will build up poison on you. It's extremely easy to get poison on this fight. Uh, but you saw there, he is... You can counter shot him and you can repost him. Uh, you can get a visceral attack on him pretty easily. This is a boss that gives a lot of people trouble. I think it's a pretty easy fight. Uh, so for this later portion of the fight, I'm gonna coat my weapon in fire. This boss really hates the fire, as do most enemies here. He's pretty weak to it. This third phase is where it gets rough. This is the phase that winds up giving people a lot of trouble, because even when you're near him now, you will get poisoned. Just being next to him starts to poison you. 
And he also has an AoE attack now, which builds up poison really heavily. He's still super easy to dodge, though. So really, you want to try to carry him into that third phase transition. Uh, while he's doing that transition in the third phase, you just pile on damage to him. You just go crazy, and it's a lot of free damage. Uh, and that makes that third phase, the really hectic one, take a lot less time. Uh, and they're even nice enough to give you antidotes behind the altar back here. So that's the Blood Star Beast. I think it's a pretty cool fight. Not that hard, though. Uh, ritual Chalice found in the Church of the Good Chalice. Use in a ritual at the Tomb Altar in the Hunter's Dream to break the seal of the old underground labyrinth. Let the Chalice reveal the Tomb of the Gods. Let blood be the Hunter's nourishment. And let ye partake in communion. The Thumerian Chalice. One of four that we're going to be encountering. Well, one of four main ones. Uh, every Chalice is like subdivision chalices which will that's uh that's that's a can of worms to open another day for now thanks for watching everyone take it easy have a good one